My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. And hello, thank you for joining me for another episode of my podcast. My guest today is Chris Kelso. Hi, Chris, how are you doing? Hey, David, I'm doing great today. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Every day is a blessing. Now, Chris, you're a two-time entrepreneur and executive coach for business owners, and you recently published a book about entrepreneurs' battle with imposter syndrome, which is a huge deal for everybody if they're honest can you talk first about yeah. your background and you know basically your background and experience in entrepreneurship and then what led you to be interested in this as an issue sure i uh so, so 20 years ago i was a software developer um wrote code and and built technology a lot of that in the healthcare industry which is a big industry in nashville tennessee where i live um, and about 14 years ago, maybe 14 and a half years ago, I decided to leave the very large company I was working for and start my first business, which was uh, a technology consulting firm. Um, I initially was on my own. I did some consulting work, started to add people to the team, eventually grew that company to, uh, you know, seven figures in revenue and had a team of mostly former CIOs and VP level uh, senior leaders in technology. And we were helping companies, a wide range of companies with their tech strategy. And over time, I, um, I started to really realize that most technology problems are people problems. Yes. And most people problems are leadership and communication problems. And so even with my technology consulting practice, we begin to focus a lot on leadership, on communication, on strategy, on conflict management, and, and, uh, and, and just leadership dynamics in an organization. Uh, I later co-founded a second company that was a tech platform, and I ran that business for a couple of years, um, and specifically was the CEO not the technology guy in that business. I had a really great uh, business partner who built all the technology for that. So I was sort of on a, on a journey of transitioning from being a tech guy myself to really being much more of a business leader and, uh, and an entrepreneur. And as I, as I put it to, to some people, I, I made a mental shift from being a tech guy who happened to own a business to really being a business owner who happened to know a lot about technology. But the tech was just secondary to what became my real passion, which was running a healthy organization and building great businesses. Yeah. So after that second business, I uh, did some consulting work with a private equity firm, kind of a turnaround situation and, uh, and decided to go headlong into leadership coaching and training. And so this has been sort of the, the third stint of my entrepreneurial career, if you will. Um, and today I coach uh, leaders, uh, mostly owner operators of small to medium sized businesses and their leadership teams. And I've done a fair bit of public speaking and training and and this topic of imposter syndrome came up. Um, well, first of all, it, it affected me quite a bit during, especially during those early years of building a business because I had no business training or really formal background. As I said, I was a software developer who suddenly found myself running a, a consulting company. And, uh, and so I felt like an imposter at times. I felt like I, I wasn't legitimate. Like I didn't have the credentials or the credibility that I needed to do what I was doing 
but all these doors were opening for me and I was just having to, to figure out my way through it and really learn on the fly quite a bit. But I didn't know what that was called. I didn't know what imposter syndrome was at the time. And it wasn't until years later working with an executive coach myself that I learned about imposter syndrome and it was fascinating to me and I began to study it and, uh, and then began to speak about it and, and work with some of my own clients around imposter syndrome. And that snowballed to some public speaking, some conferences and events. And then eventually uh, in 2020, I wrote this book, Overcoming the Imposter, that, that we published in January of 21. Now, I think most people have an idea of what they think imposter syndrome is. What is it really? And part two of that are, I want to also ask, are there levels or types? So the basic definition of imposter syndrome, and th this term was, by the way, coined in the 1970s. It's not a brand new idea. Um, but when it was originally uh, coined by psych some psychologists who were studying, you know, psychological dy dynamics in, uh, in corporate America, um, it was originally thought to mostly affect women. And that's a little bit of a, a misnomer or mis misunderstanding about imposter syndrome because early on, all the study was around women kind of climbing the ranks in corporate America. Um, and, uh, but many studies since then have shown that it affects men and women equally, that it's, uh, that it's not just a female problem. It's not just a, a minority problem or anything like that. It's, it, it, it cuts across cultural and, uh, and gender differences and those kind of things. So, but to define it, since you asked for a, a definition, essentially people who struggle with imposter syndrome have this, this nagging doubt, this fear that maybe their success isn't really legitimate, or maybe they have some credibility or credential that they don't truly deserve. Mm. And they tend to overvalue other people's success and undervalue or even doubt the reality of their own accomplishments. And so someone with imposter syndrome may look at David Summerfleck and say, well, gosh, David's got it all together because he's smart and savvy and he, he has a plan and he executes it well and he seems to know what he's doing. Whereas my success has been the result of some luck and some timing and man, there's a lot of things that I've done wrong and made mistakes, but managed to figure my way out of it. And then there have been a few things that have just fallen my way that happen to be in the right place at the right time. And and maybe I'm not really legitimate. Maybe I'm not what everybody seems to think that I am. And and the underlying fear there is that mm. sooner or later, someone or everyone is going to figure out that I've just been making it up as I go, that I really don't know what I'm doing. And that if that happens, I'm going to be exposed as a fraud, as an imposter. And then it's all going to come crumbling down around me. And not everyone feels it that acutely and that strongly. Um, but studies have shown that up to 70 or 80% of the population wrestles with some form of imposter syndrome at some point in their career where they feel like they're in over their head or they, uh, or their success maybe is not completely deserved. And they're worried that people are going to figure that out. You asked about different types. What I would say is that it's a very common phenomenon. As I said, 70, 80% of the population deals with this. But it's a really unique experience for each person because we all struggle with imposter syndrome for our own reason. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Part of my story, and I wrote about this in the book, is that I never went to college. I don't have a college degree. And so now I've founded and run two companies and I'm coaching leaders. I've coached people with master's degrees and PhDs and, and, you know, a lot more education than I have. And especially early on as a business owner, I thought, man, eventually someone's going to figure out that I don't have a degree or I'm going to be in some situation where there's a, a concept that was taught on the very first day of business school that, that I wasn't there for. And that's, what's going to sink me. But I've also talked to people who have advanced degrees 
and they struggle with imposter syndrome for some completely different reason. There's some other part of their past or their history that they think is the thing that's going to hold them back, that's going to sink them. So it's a, it's a unique experience. It's a very common experience, but it's also a unique tailored experience because the thing you fear is going to be specific to your story and your background. Hmm. So, I mean, is there a way to say in general terms why some people have or suffer from it and while others don't? I mean, for example, for me, I remember, I mean, I worked for marketing agencies for like 20, 25 years, and it wasn't until I was a business mentor for multiple nonprofit organizations off and on for like 10 years. It wasn't until at the end of that, that I finally stopped and just said, you know what? I'm tired of answering the, the, you know, all of these questions from hundreds of people for all this time. I'm not getting paid for my time. I'm doing it out of the kindness of my heart to get the experience. But I finally feel that I have enough experience. I know what they're going to say before they say it. I know what they're going to ask before they ask it. They all have the same problems. But as you said before, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's due to personality conflicts more than anything technical that, you know, could help them with. But then on the flip side of that, I remember working at an agency and I had a high ranking agency supervisor slash manager. Obviously, I don't want to say the person's name. Very nice, very affable person. Okay. Very likable. But the position required a certain degree. He didn't have the degree. He didn't have the degree. He hadn't had the degree for a long time. And I remember asking him once over lunch, how do you keep getting these incredible positions where you're making, you know, six figure incomes here and you don't have the degree that they all want you to have? And he just kind of smiled and laughed. And he's just like, I don't know. I just have really good interviews and I joke around with people. I just don't care. And if they ask, I tell them I'm working toward it, but I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. But it was like so extreme. Here I am feeling insecure. Do I have the credentials and the education to say I am a, capable of being a business mentor or saying I'm a digital marketing expert after all this experience and, 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 and strife and everything? And here he was. He didn't even have the degree he said he did. And he's just racks up these incredible jobs. He'd take two, three hour lunch breaks. Sometimes he'd go out and get a little bit plowed in the process, so completely, you know, ambivalent at best about actually doing the job. What was the dynamic there? Why did I have it? But he didn't seem to be bothered one little bit. Well, you know, without knowing him personally, it's, it's hard to, uh, to, prescribe too much what's exactly is going on there. But I can say there, there's a group of people that never struggle with imposter syndrome and that have zero self doubt. Uh, and they're called narcissists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, he there, there are some people one. that are so self-absorbed that they believe they can do anything. And if you combine narcissism with great charisma, yeah then you get somebody who can kind of talk themselves into any situation and then just believe that they can get through it. And I think that was, often, the, yeah, I think that was often those, the case. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, often those people, they make it a long way and then eventually they hit a wall or they find themselves in some situation that they, that they can't perform in. But, you know, even then sometimes they can talk their way out of it. Um, you and know, I, I used to say that, I used to say that either you have imposter syndrome or some level of imposter syndrome or you're a narcissist, but I'll acknowledge that I have met some people that, uh, that truly don't have a lot of self doubt, but they're also fairly humble and genuine. And they're, they're, they're just optimistic and confident. And that's combined with a level of, uh, of humility and realism that, uh, that makes them pretty even keeled. And, that is really, really admirable. But 
Um, I will say that's very rare um, because most of us deal with some form of self-doubt or wondering or questioning. And I, I would even go so far as to say it's healthy to have a little bit of self-doubt. And I wouldn't want to present the idea that my book is going to tell you how to get rid of your self-doubt completely because it won't. What it's going to do is tell you how to recognize it and manage it and then to harness that energy and use it for good things in your life to, to turn it into fuel rather than letting it hold you back. Uh, because that's what I think you really need to do is recognize that self-doubt can be a good sign and can be a marker and a guidepost to tell you where the opportunities are. Yeah. And I was going to say th what's interesting about the point you made was that this person in particular, um, I later f found out, I mean, he, he was later unceremoniously let go by the company and I yeah. I actually, I did some, some digging and everything because I was just curious about this method, you know, uh, and you know, this person. And I found out that he had never held a job for more than two years, mm -hmm. but he was so likable and such a nice person and everything. At least he seemed like that. And I remember one time he invited me over to his home to, to run some errand or something because he was higher up the food chain. Right. And he probably invited me there just to, for his own, uh, ease, you know, to run some errand or whatever. But anyway, I'm, okay. I'll stop by your house and, and pick this up or whatever. So I stopped by the house. I was floored because I thought it was going to be this really nice house. It was an apartment, a tiny little two bedroom apartment. Well, it's him, his wife, and three kids in a two bed in a two bedroom apartment. I open the door. I you literally have to watch your step, or you would step on a stack of CDs, or someone's laptop, or someone's you know a stack of clothing or something. I'd never seen anything like it. Hmm. And um, I, yeah, I think that was like a couple of weeks after. I don't remember if that was before or after he got let go by the company. And I, I have no idea what happened to him since then. But it was really, like you said, it was really odd. It was like there's something going on here beneath the surface. There was, charisma. There was probably more char charisma uh, and personality than substance there. Yeah, it was really odd. And I, I do remember like a couple months later, he called me up and said, Hey, I got another job at another agency. Man, this is great. Come on mm -hmm. by and talk to me. Okay, I'll go over. Beautiful corner office with this beautiful view of the mountains and everything. And making six figures. And again, and he offered me a position there at the company as his underling again, you know, second in command kind of position like before. But the difference was this time I said, hey, thank you so much. Let's keep in touch. But I, I, I can't be, I can't do that same position twice. And then like a couple of weeks later, he was gone. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, why does it seem like entrepreneurs are more likely to struggle with Im imposter syndrome? And what role do you think perfectionism play? Is yeah. it? Yeah. So the. It's a great question because, you know, what I've found is that imposter syndrome tends to be more prevalent among high achievers, innovators, people who are pushing the boundaries and trying new things. And that's a little bit counterintuitive. Like you, you, you would think at first blush that entrepreneurs are really confident and they must be the people who don't have a lot of self-doubt because they try all these new things. But when you dig in and really start to understand imposter syndrome, what happens is it, it, it attacks you the most when you're outside of your comfort zone. When you're, when you're trying something new, when you're doing something that maybe you've never done before, or in some cases, maybe no one's ever done before. And so that voice of doubt, that question of, do you really know what you're doing can be strongest when you're outside of your element, when you're really pushing yourself and you're trying to stretch. And so entrepreneurs by nature are risk takers. They're people who try new things. They create things that didn't exist before. They experiment and they fail a lot. Um, they have to fail a lot in that experimentation in order to learn what works to figure out what's going to 
bring them success. And so that opens up a lot of doors for self-doubt. And there's a couple of dynamics at play with entrepreneurs. One is that the fact that they're experimenting, they're trying new things, they're taking risks. Um, another is that entrepreneurs are almost always in sales mode. They're, they're always yeah. pitching the very best version of whatever it is they're doing, right? If they're not presenting, if they're not pitching potential customers, they might be talking to people they want to hire or people they want to be a part of their team or partners. Um, a few entrepreneurs will raise money like you see on shows like Shark Tank and, and you know, they're going to pitch investors and they're always telling the very best version of their story that they can. Right. But deep down, they know that there's flaws and there's cracks and that, that what they're presenting is only one side of the story because everybody's business has issues and challenges. And there's always stuff that we really have going well and stuff that we're still struggling to, to figure out and to perfect. So an entrepreneur can feel like they're maybe presenting a version of their business that isn't real. In and many the cases, third, they are. Th they are to some yeah. degree. And, and then the third dynamic is that entrepreneurs get put on a pedestal. Um, there, there was a CEO named Toby Thomas who used an illustration that I have just sort of adopted as my go-to description of entrepreneurship. He said that an entrepreneur is like a man riding on a lion. And e everyone around him is looking at the man saying, wow, that's amazing. That is so cool. That guy's so brave. I wish I had the guts to do what he's doing. And all the while, the man on the lion is thinking, how in the world did I end up on a lion? And how do I keep from being eaten by it? Yeah. Right. And that is so true for entrepreneurs. Many of them are put on pedestals, are celebrated, are, you know, given accolades and awards for the risks that they take and the, and the trials and the struggles and the things that they get through. And all the while they're thinking, man, I'm just making this up as I go. I'm just figuring this out along the way. And so that combination of sort of being on a pedestal, being in sales mode a lot and, and getting outside of your comfort zone means that entrepreneurs frequently find themselves feeling it over their heads. And that voice of self doubt that would say, you, you really don't know what you're doing. You're, you're, you're just one misstep away from a total catastrophe. That, that voice can get really loud and really strong in their heads. And in my work with entrepreneurs, and I've worked with hundreds of them, um, I see it as an almost universal trait. Like, like I said, they're, they're just either flat out narcissist and they think they can do anything, or they, they do have some struggle with that voice of self doubt that they have to battle every day for, uh, for the things that they're trying to accomplish. So the next question I want to ask you is what, how does suffering from imposter syndrome, or, or I should say, how have you seen it uh, impact the lives of people, whether they're creative people or entrepreneurs or just, you know, people in general? There, there's a number of, negative effects that it can have. And some of them are just um, emotional, you know, feeling unworthy or having those doubts that make you really uncomfortable. But some can be disastrous. Um, unfortunately, I've seen and I've shared a couple stories in my book of, of entrepreneurs who essentially self-sabotaged um, their careers or their businesses because they they let those doubts get so strong, they let that voice get so loud and prominent that they almost begin to work to make it true, right? The self-sabotage -sab happens when, you're, when your brain believes something so strongly that it, it starts to change your behavior. So for instance, um, you worry that your work is not going to be high quality enough, so you start avoiding the hard work. Well, when you avoid the hard work, it's not very high quality right. and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, if you're afraid of rejection from a really big customer and you avoid going to that really big customer and talking to them or you delay, you have an opportunity with them, the doors open, but you drag your feet and you, you don't send them the information quick enough because you're not certain about whether you got it right. And 
then all of a sudden that door slams shut because that customer doesn't want to do work with you because you are procrastinating, because you're not responsive, because you don't come across as confident in your presentation. And so self-doubt can become a self-fulfilling prophecy because the things you believe about yourself, you eventually act out. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's really important to get a hold of this and to get a handle on it and to be able to counteract that voice and not let it dominate your thinking to the point that it starts to really affect your behavior and, and hurt you in the process. Yeah. And that's where I really wanted to get to the heart of how can we recognize imposter syndrome and then how can we not necessarily treat it, but cope with it. So there's a couple of things that you can do to regulate and manage that voice of self doubt. One of the big ones is to change the way that you think about failure. So if failure is fatal, if a mistake is going to kill you, if, if, a if an error or a misstep is going to be detrimental to your career, you're going to be really risk averse. You're going to be really challenged to go after those big opportunities. You're not going to call that big potential client. You're not going to get up and give that presentation. But if you start to see failure differently, and the way I encourage people to think of failure is failure is learning. And I, I give dozens of examples uh, in the book of people who failed their way to success. Uh, you know, Thomas Edison famously said, I did not fail a thousand times in trying to create the light bulb. I simply figured out a thousand ways not to create a light bulb, <laughs> right? He saw the failure and the experimentation as learning. And when you start to reframe failure as as a learning opportunity, when you can, when you decide for yourself, because it is a decision, it's a decision and a discipline that every time I fail, I'm going to learn something from it. I'm going to take something away that benefits me, that makes me better the next time around. And the, the reality is we learn more from failure than we do from success. Well, if you can adopt that mindset, suddenly you don't fear failure, you embrace failure. You look for opportunities to try something where the risk of failure is high because it's not a risk of failure. It's a risk of learning. It's a risk of gaining something. It's a risk of getting better. And simply by changing that mindset, what you can do is begin to, to, to hear the voice of the imposter, the voice of the inner critic as a signpost of a learning opportunity. So when you're going to do something or you're thinking about taking a risk or you're thinking about, and that voice comes in and says, no, you can't do it. You don't, you're not qualified. You don't have the credentials. You're not ready. You do what I've trained myself to do. And I don't do this hundred percent, but I'm, I'm definitely getting better at it is to hear that voice and translate that to there's an, a learning opportunity here. There's a chance for me to do something I've never done and get better at it. And, and to add something to my repertoire, even if I don't, get it perfect, even if I don't nail it, even if it's a horrible experience the first time around, the only way to get to the second time is to get through the first time. The only way to get to the eventual success when you do something over and over and over until it becomes habitual and it just is muscle memory is to do it the first really awkward and painful time. And so when I hear that voice, I think, ooh, I'm on the verge of a learning opportunity. There's something here for me to gain. If that voice says you're, you're around people that you don't deserve to be around, you don't measure up. These people are smarter than you. They're better than you. You, you don't belong in this group. I translate that to, wow, there's a lot for me to glean from this group. This is a learning opportunity, a growth opportunity, a stretching. I may feel out of place. I may feel inferior. But if I push through that inferiority, instead of letting it pull me back, then I'm surrounded by people that can help me grow, that can pull me up, that can strengthen me. At the very least, I can learn something from this group who, you know, must be further down the road or more experienced or whatever the case may be than I am. So a lot of it is about reframing that voice 
and reframing how you think about failure so that you can turn insecurity and fear and doubt into a signpost that opportunities exist and there's great knowledge to be gained if you just push through it and try and experiment. So see it as a step in a learning process. Yes. And the road right. to success is paved with failures along the way. Well, yeah, as you said, Thomas Edison, uh, you know, took him a thousand attempts to finally make a working light bulb. And I remember reading that uh, Walt Disney had declared bankruptcy seven times. And um, I remember reading that uh, Shakespeare's first play, which was Titus Andronicus, was absolutely horrible. It was made into a movie one time and that was it. And it tanked in the box office. I don't, most people have never heard of it for that very reason. It's like a horror movie with there's like heads floating in soup and stuff. It's just awful. So what else can we learn about imposter syndrome to perhaps better recognize it or perhaps uh, deal with it, you know, in our daily lives? So there's two primary fears that the voice of the imposter is going to prey on. And the first I've already mentioned is the fear of failure. And if you can change that definition of failure in your own mind, you take away that tool, that weapon. The second fear is the fear of vulnerability. The imposter, that inner critic is going to tell you that if people figure out who you really are, then they're not going to like you. They're not going to respect you. You're going to lose your credibility. If people figure out your real story, the one with the bumps in the road and mistakes along the way and the lack of whatever it is you don't have that you think is the critical flaw, if they figure that out, that's when you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be ostracized. You're going to be shut out, whatever. And so the way to counteract that is just to be vulnerable, to, to be authentic with people. You know, I used to fear that people would find out that I didn't have a college degree. Now I just tell people that I don't have a college degree. And guess what? I don't think I've ever been shunned <laughs> because I didn't have a college degree. I don't think I've ever right. been denied an opportunity because I didn't have a college degree, especially when I just get honest with people and, uh, and their reaction is never as negative as it was built up in my mind. And so I, by being vulnerable, by admitting weakness, um, even by talking about some of my failures as an entrepreneur, the things that I've tried that didn't work, a, the, that tool, that weapon of the imposter that tries to hold that over my head that you can't let people figure that out. Yeah. And I think, you know, for my own case and in a lot of other people who I see online who are developers or writers or bloggers or um, artistic, you know, people who you, they call creatives. I don't really like the term, but, you know, artists and what have you, they always feel that they want the work they do to be great. They want it to be comparable to the work of other people others who are top in their field, you know, if I, I, I'm working on a novel now, but I look at it and I think, man, is this going to, you know, is this really going to be the book that I want it to be? I really want it to move people and really be entertaining, but also uh, engrossing. So is it going to do that? And I see this all the time online. People are very open about it. And in some of these forums, I just designed this, website for a client. I, I want it to rank number one in Google. I don't know if it's going to. I want it to win awards for design, of course. I don't know if it will. Is it, is it good enough? Is it up to these standards? What advice would you have for that, you know, that, that type of imposter syndrome or that level? Okay, Chris, could you, I'm sorry to cut you off. Could you go ahead and, and please answer that? Yes. So I, I, I'll be honest with you, David. I, had imposter syndrome about being an author, about writing this book as I was writing, you know, this is my first book. I've never written a book before. And I, I wondered honestly, if I could write a book that would be good enough that I would want my name on the cover. And, and so I did a couple of things. One is I, 
I, I brought great people around me. I had a fantastic team between my publisher and I hired a great writing coach. And, and that's one part of this message, I guess, that I would want to say to your listeners is overcoming imposter syndrome does not mean becoming Superman and believing that you can do anything and everything on your own, right? We, we need to, to bring, we need mentors, we need experts. And that's part of the message of the book. But I had to battle my own imposter syndrome during the writing of this book because I was, it was my first time. And, and I learned that every time you try something new for the first time, there's an opportunity for that voice to come in and say, you don't know what you're doing. You, you, can't, you can't do this. But I had an interesting revelation just a couple of weeks ago, actually. I was, I was meeting with a peer group. I have a group of a dozen people that I'm taking through my book chapter by chapter. And one of the members has written several books and is working on another one. And we were kind of talking about the learning process and the progression of getting anything. This is the worst book I will ever write. If I apply myself, if I take everything I've learned from this experience to get better, this can and should be the worst book of my career. And so when I write something new, the next time I do something, it's going to be even better than this. Right. So in other words, if you learn from any constructive criticism, then you're going to be much better because next time that you do it, you'll have learned from constructive criticism, but also any, any objective issues that you could find. Yeah. It, and it's not even so much criticism as just the experience itself. Right? Well, yeah, Anytime that's a really good point. First time you look back and say, there are some things I would do differently the second time around. And so the, the, the challenge of perfectionism is we want it to be perfect right out of the gate. We want it to be perfect the first time we do it, but there are some things you can only learn by doing. Yeah. So you can't be perfect right out of the gate. So you just have to dismiss that possibility and not think about, not, not, worry yourself with trying to nail it on the first try and think more about the first attempt being your stepping stone towards perfection as you progress as a designer, as a developer, as an author, as a speaker, as a creator. In whatever you're doing, it's the doing that the learning comes from. And if you try to if you try to perfect it in the lab, you try to cook it up and get the perfect exact recipe and then go make it for the first time and you want to, you know, knock it out of the park and win an award, that scenario is really, really unlikely. But but holding on to that perfectionism will keep you from taking that first swing, will keep you from going out and doing that first one. And that first one is the first step towards the next one that's even better and even better. So... I guess, David, to answer your question, I mean, you have to shift your mindset from a binary mindset where it's either perfection or failure to a progression mindset, a growth mindset, where every time I do something, I want it to be a little better than the last time. Mm. And every time I do something that I'm not happy with, I learn everything I can to apply that the next time around. And the goal is not to be perfect the first time. The goal is to continue to move towards perfection, my entire life, my entire career. And whether I ever achieve perfection or not, if I'm continually progressing, then I'm successful. My, my definition, my personal definition of success, one of the keys is progress, that I'm moving in the right direction, that I'm better today than I was yesterday. And there may not be a destination to ever reach, but I'm on the journey every day and I'm not going backwards, I'm moving forwards. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think it's a very, very good uh, place to, to tie this particular conversation up. Um, Chris, I really appreciate your time. And for anybody listening, if, if you noticed any kind of glitches with the sound or audio, uh, we have a part one and part two where we resumed the conversation. So 
could have to do with all the thunderstorms here in Florida. I have no idea. But anyway, Chris, thank you so much for your time. For those who want to read your book and learn more about your coaching, how can they best get in touch with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find online. If you remember, my name starts with a K, K-R-I-S, Kelso, K-E-L-S-O. So you can find me at chriskelso.com or you can specifically find the book at overcomingtheimposter.com. And uh, from either one of those websites, you can order the book, you can send me a message, you can read more about my coaching and my public speaking work and uh, programs that I'm running and see some emails from clients and, and audience members to, to learn more about it. This sounds absolutely great. Thanks again for your time, Chris. Please stick around for another minute or two. And for uh, those out there watching and listening, thank you for your time. And if you enjoyed our conversation together, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.